All right, thank you, Vice President Jones. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Marissa T. Adonis. I serve as the Chief Executive Officer of MTA Visions Global CSR, the Wayne Ferris firm, based right here in DC. I have the distinct pleasure of serving as your moderator for today's panel, entitled Going Global, Developing International Affairs Strategies for Both Cities and States. And so with me, I have first, Mr. Jean-François Houd. Thank you for joining us thank today. Thank you so much. Uh, Jean-François Houd began his third posting in the United States in July 2020 as director of the government office in Washington. In this capacity, he's responsible for furthering Quebec's bilateral relations with the U.S. federal government. Previously, he served as Quebec's representative in Chicago, fostering Quebec political and economic relations in the Midwest. Bienvenue, merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup. It's a practice on my language today. Um, finally, we have Ambassador Nina Kachikin. Ambassador Nina is the first U.S. Special Representative for City and State Diplomacy. In this role, she seeks to bring benefits to and learn from local leaders in the United States and connect them with counterparts around the world. Before rejoining the State Department, Ambassador Kachikin served as the first Deputy Mayor for International Affairs for the City of Los Angeles and as the U.S. Ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. She was awarded the State Department's Superior Honor Award for her service. She's also the founder of the Women Ambassadors Serving America and of the Leadership Council for Women and National Security, LC Wings, which has had a great impact on my national security career. So it's good to meet the person behind all of my success. <laughs> and last but not least, at the end of the podium, we have Dr. Alexis Rutsch. Dr. Rutsch currently serves as Chief Executive Officer of SciTech Diploma, which is the leading international think and do tank working at the intersection of science, technology, and foreign affairs. He has over 15 years experience as Senior Advisor on Science Diplomacy, the Ministries of Foreign Affairs and Science of Governance across Asia, Europe, and Latin America. He also serves as Barcelona's Chief Science and Tech Envoy. Bienvenidos y gracias de antemano por tus aportes. Gracias. Okay. And you don't have languages today. So <laughs> let's go ahead and get started. So as you know, the purpose of this panel is to provide you all with insights and strategies and how you can go about building your respective city diplomacy departments or your international affairs departments, or if you're a stakeholder that's seeking to engage with municipalities, hopefully from our panel today, you'll find some interesting avenues to engage in those respective partnerships. So one thing that we wanted to talk about was the basics. And usually the point of entry for city diplomacies is through an international affairs office. And so we've seen in the recent reports that the United States is currently behind compared to Europe and China and establishing the various offices. So I thought it'd be good for us to set the stage and provide each of our speakers to talk a little bit about how did they go about starting their international affairs offices so that if you're in that same position now and you're trying to figure out, you know, do I have to pass a resolution or do I need to hire staff? Hopefully you can pick some best practices from each of our speakers to implement moving forward. So Ambassador Hachigan, I'll start with you. Uh, since you were the first deputy mayor for international affairs in the United States, can you share with us, you know, what are some of the strategies that you utilize for building out this office in Los Angeles, California? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you need sauna. Can people hear me? Okay. Uh, I think you need. Oh, sorry. I think you need three things. Uh, fundamental things to kind of start to start an office. So one would be vision from your political leader, or at least buy-in from a political leader. Um, second, you know, a, a plan or a or a direction. Um, and third, some capacity. So I was lucky to work for a mayor who had previously taught international relations. He's now our US ambassador to India. So he clearly had a global perspective from the beginning and a real passion for uh, climate change, you know, uh, addressing climate change. Um, but uh, when it came to the rest of City Hall, though it might sound obvious that LA is an international city, uh, you know, second largest city in the U.S. and like 40% foreign born uh, among its people. But it was not obvious to most people in City Hall why there should be an international office. So it took some time for my colleagues to see the advantages of having global ties. 
when it came to creating jobs, um, to bringing events, to uh, learning innovations that we could try, leadership that we could exert, um, students that we could send on trips that wouldn't otherwise have had a chance, and so on. So the mayor's vision and his interests were critical, otherwise I would never have been able to get anything done. Um, so you need then a plan or a direction um, or specific um, and some specific goals that you want to uh, accomplish. And in that case, you're just starting from what your city wants or needs or is good at or cares about. Um, so I spoke to a, f a mayor from Florida recently who's very internationally focused, but only when it comes to horses. So he's, you know, he is like the, you know, international horse capital, uh, you know, in Florida. And so his international strategy is all about horses and which countries have horses and, you know, the fanciest horses and all that. Um, so it'll be completely different depending on your city. Um, you know, I, uh, our vision was about, you know, bringing jobs and investment. That's maybe common to everybody. Solving global problems that affect our people. Um, partnering with all the local diaspora groups and you know organizations, um, and giving young people international experiences, uh, and then um, finally on capacity, I began with a very small team. But again, as we proved ourselves, we were able to get some more people. We got grants from foundations to let us hire people, um, and that was another you know really useful uh, strategy. So I can end there. I think those are the basics. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so one of the programs that we have at MTA Visions um, is centered around city diplomacy. So we strive to help cities and states create an international first strategy, but oftentimes beyond the international first strategy, that strategy stays dormant. It's in someone's economic development's office. So a couple of years ago, when at the start of the pandemic, we decided to start serving as the external international affairs offices mm -hmm. to include picking up, picking up the phones, um, doing uh, handling trade missions and related for a variety of cities. I know that Barcelona was the first city to establish a science diplomacy program. And I know Ambassador Chigan just gave a really great example of how cities, depending on what their interests aligns with, their city diplomacy program or what motivates them to even get involved in international affairs can be very, very, very narrow. So can you maybe talk about the International Affairs Office in the city of Barcelona and highlight some of the science diplomacy that you guys are working on? Sure, thank you. Well, Barcelona has had a long-lasting commitment to, 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 bring, to, to, to foster global municipalism movement. And, 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 and that's something that's been happening for the last 20, 30 years. And then mayors from different parties have been supporting this, this view and, 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 and this strategy. That's also one of the reasons why some of the, some of the main uh, international city networks are headquartered in Barcelona, like UCLG, United Cities and Local Governance, Governments, uh, Metropolis, which is the global network of metropolitan areas. And this is, all, this is mainly because of the interest of the city of Barcelona to put municipalism at the center of, of global governance uh, uh, as well. But beyond this commitment to city diplomacy and many projects that has been developed at the city level for, for the last years, in, in 2018 we identified opportunity that um, there was this trend where national governments, uh, because of all these global challenges that we have been discussing today from global health to climate change and so on, national governments are more and more involved into science and technology diplomacy because science and tech are essential to tackle all these challenges. And, and, and at some point we were like, if we are leading in city diplomacy and science diplomacy is a more and more relevant issue in global governance and, and traditional, so to say, diplomacy, why we're not bringing these two things together? And that's how in 2018, Barcelona launched uh, the world's first uh, city-led science diplomacy strategy. And, 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 and the approach is it's, it's quite novel in the sense that it's not exclusively led by the city government, but it's a non-profit public-private partnership where it's the city, the regional government of Catalonia, uh, all the universities in the city, research centers, tech companies, uh, the major, the, the, the main philanthropic institutions fund, uh, funding science, that all together they, they, they are the board that is in charge of governing this strategy that positions Barcelona as a reliable partner for science and technology, and that's what allows to bring the voice of, 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 of um, 
researchers in, in our institutions in Barcelona or CEOs of startups that are working, for instance, uh, on, on, on tackling climate-related issues to COP meetings. We are sending delegations as a city uh, through science. We made Barcelona the world's first city to be uh, a full member of the International Science Council, which is the main international organization that gathers national councils of science. So. Uh, it's yet another way of bringing the voice of the city uh, through science and technology and becoming influential because uh, many times city diplomacy strategy strategies have been very focused on, on attractiveness, on being attractive, attractive attracting uh, foreign direct investment, attracting more and better tourism, attracting talent. But uh, at some point we were feeling like we were doing kind of well in this regard, but we needed something else. We needed not, to, not only to be attractive, but to be influential. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and by bringing the voice of our science tech ecosystem to all this global discussion and global fora, we are making the city and the values we represent uh, more, more influential. And that's well, that, and then we could go further into uh, this experience, but that, that, that's a bit the, 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 the basics on, on this science diplomacy strategy that Barcelona is led. Thanks for sharing that. Speaking of influential, since 1964, Quebec has signed more than 550 international agreements and more than 300 are still valid today with 29 different countries. So can you maybe talk about how Quebec has characterized its international affairs strategy? And since you manage the Washington, D.C. office, maybe share a little bit about the portfolio issues that you cover. Yes, yes. Uh, with pleasure, like Anna. I'm very humbled to, to, to be here at the, at the Meriden Center today. Uh, and I see my friends from Catalonia. Uh, we work closely with them. Like, we are like a lot of subnational actors uh, active in Washington. My colleagues from Ontario, Alberta as well. Uh, we are working closely with the Flanders, with, with, with the Scots, with the, the Basque Country. Uh, and I think like it's very interesting. And I thank the Meriden to making more room and more room for uh, the subnational dialogue. Uh, it's very, I think, like key right now in the world that we are living, living in. Um, and I'm very humble also because uh, 68 years ago, uh, the principle or the cardinal principle of the Quebec uh, national action was uh, dictated by Paul Gérin Lajoie, who was our Minister of Education back then. So like cultural and education diplomacy back then, when he announced like, and I wanted to quote him, like I tried to I freely translate what he said, but in all areas of the worldly and partially within its jurisdiction, Quebec now intends to play a direct role consistent with its personality and extent of its rights. So in a nutshell, what is under its jurisdiction at home is also under its jurisdiction abroad. And I, they changed like completely the way we are navigating like learning. To, and this is like the cardinal principles. And when I think about like or my other colleagues like uh, of some national or regional governments like doing this action, it's really what we are looking at, how we can be part of the solutions, how we can bring water to the mills. And to echo what Ambassador Chigan was mentioning about how she has developed like with the three principles of like diplomacy, I think like knowing who we are in terms of what roles we can play and how having a seat at the table when we can be part of the solution. And also uh, this like as the mayor of Bogota and Richmond was mentioning earlier, where we can be part of, because of we are so close to the citizens, this kind of obligation of results that we have, understanding the challenges of our populations. So these three principles, echoing like the strategy that you have put in place with the cities, I think are like the cardinal principles of like how we are pursuing our, and because I mean, we are the remaining part of French speakers. It's not a funny accent that I have. It's like, we, we want like, to make sure that French is surviving in North America and we can also like, uh, like thrive like in, in this global world uh, with our culture and our identity. I think that's how we shape ourselves. So now I'm, I mean, again, very humble about the role that I'm playing in, in Washington because I'm one of like the 34 representatives that we have in 19 countries. We have more than 600 employees with our own little state department in some ways. In fact, it's 700 agreements that we have like a uh, total. So it's, it's very exciting for me in this like world. It's like finding where Quebec is, can be a part of the solution. Not only attractive investments, but like where we in this world, we can like build these two way streets, understanding that we are not, and I think it's the mayor of Richmond was mentioning that we don't have all the solutions. We might not have all the solutions, but I understand that part of this chain of value chain or international value chains, Quebec it can be a strong link at different places and we can be part of the solutions. So that's very exciting for me like to, to develop this kind of relationship with the administration, the Congress, the think tanks and, and the great leaders like here in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Mr. Holt. So American success abroad and on the world stage is directly linked to U.S. policies and actions at home. 
So this includes expanding our responsibility of international affairs beyond Washington and the federal government. Members of the U.S. Congress, constrained oftentimes by party politics, understand the gridlock can impact and often delay foreign policy. So Congressman Ted Lieu from California recognized the city's abilities to facilitate public diplomacy, and as a result, introduced H.R. 4256, City and State Diplomacy Act, in the 117th Congress. This act was aiming to propose ways in which the Department of State could strengthen and formalize connections to U.S. cities and states in order to advance American diplomatic interests and engagement. While H.R. 4256 did not pass, Congress lose amendment to fiscal year's 23 National Defense Authorization Act was accepted in this pass, which then created the Office of the City and State Diplomacy at the State Department to support local engagement with foreign entities. Ambassador Hachigan, what is your mandate in your current position as the inaugural State Department Special Representative for City and State Diplomacy? I think I described it in my in my um, you know talk just now, but to to be you know brief, we are um, developing and coordinating um, policies uh, for the local level um, in the State Department. We want to be an easy front door for mayors and governors and county officials and anyone at the local level to help uh, answer any questions they have. We are encouraging cities and states to act internationally and thinking through with them how to create the capacity to do that. Um, we're connecting our State Department colleagues with um, you folks who they often want input from local leaders um, and we, we facilitate that connection. And then um, delivering benefits of foreign policy to the local level. Uh, and that could be, like, as I said, around job creation or student exchange or advice or, you know, any number of things. Um, you know, this is all part of a foreign policy for all Americans. We've, we mm -hmm. think of ourselves as a big uh, piece of fulfilling that mandate. Thank you. So when developing international affairs strategies for cities, states, and embassies, and sometimes ministries of foreign affairs, MTA Visions, we tend to create what we call in-between diplomacy. And there are six strategic points that we utilize when crafting international affairs strategies, but three are key, programs, policies, and partnerships. So for example, we've written the business investment policy for Mecklenburg County. Um, beyond facilitating the traditional MOUs between global cities and domestic cities, we went a step further to ensure that the engagements are sustainable. So for example, in Mexico City, where they actually amended their existing constitution to add an Article 25 entitled Global City, which would ensure that it's a part of the city's functional operations to engage in international affairs. But program is also an extremely important strategic point that we like to curate at MTA Visions. Usually it's centered around economic development programs since that tends to be our natural partners with the cities that we work with. A lot of times we'll do youth participation that helps engage politics and diplomacy for youth centered through Youth Leading Now. Oftentimes, um, most creatively, we've helped cities figure out ways to leverage the diaspora communities that are living to help them engage with international businesses or even to facilitate introductions to other foreign countries. Um, and one of my favorites, working with the universities that are, are located in that city, along with the university and their existing partnering city globally to establish knowledge sharing between academics. So Mr. Rutch, um, I know that you also provide training on diplomatic skills for city and local officials. So can we talk about what's included in your training? Sure. Um, it, it was part when, when the science diplomacy strategy of Barcelona was created and, and, and we were refurbishing our entire international relations strategy five years ago, uh, a, a central part of it was like not not being the only ones doing what we thought it was the way to do city diplomacy, but also empowering other cities and, and, ex and exchanging best, best practices. So um, uh, in, in this regard, we work a lot on, on, on building capacity building programs for city officials, for people working on international relations officers, office, uh, uh, offices, to give them the skills and the tools to, to, to do their job. And uh, we actually publish a, a report just uh, four or five months ago, together with Metropolis, the global network of metropolitan areas, on, on the, which is called Monitoring Internationalization Strategies in Cities and Metropolitan Spaces. I'll have, be happy to share the link uh, later on. 
uh, which focuses on analyzing some best practices on how different cities and metropolitan areas approach uh, international relations and how to assess that because many of uh, many of the international relations that cities or states can do are, are most of the times under what we could call a uh, Public diplomacy or or second tier diplomacy. So it's 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 when when you try to evaluate what's the impact of that, it's much more harder because I mean I mean it's easy to count number of exchanges, number of events, number of attendees, but what's the actual impact of of of, of this? So to, we we analyze this, we analyze the case through interviews to the mayors and international officers of the cities of Seoul in Korea, Johannesburg in South Africa, Santiago in Chile, Toronto in Canada, and Barcelona. And, and we extracted plenty of really cool best practices from them, and also uh, some conclusions and policy recommendations on 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 how to approach better international relations. One of the main conclusions was that uh, most of these cities there were feeling they were lacking a cohesive and comprehensive strategy uh, at the city level across departments in the city government, because even if there is an international department, relations department, it's not the only one engaging internationally. They, many of them, they also have other international counterparts, uh, but not only across departments in the city, uh, city government, but also with other stakeholders in the city, universities, as you, as you were mentioning, that have their counterparts and their partnerships uh, uh, abroad, the private sector, uh, and, 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 and many others, and not only at this level of stakeholders inside the urban area, but also in the multi-layer governance, also with the state, with the national uh, government, how these different diplomacies interact and complement uh, each other. And well, there were other conclusions about proactivity versus reactivity, where usually city diplomacy tends to be, uh, if it's not we're, we're well strategized, very uh, reactive. We, we, the delegation is coming, we need to, to, to plan something, or protocol related and it's less proactive and, 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 and creating priorities for, for what topics or areas or regions in the world are our priority for the city. And, 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 and then coming to, you, to your question, when, when another really relevant conclusion was that uh, city officials working on international relations were feeling they were lacking proper training in international relations. Because with some exceptions, I mean, not, not everybody was an ambassador after, uh, and then a deputy mayor of a city. Um, um, uh, most of them, they were like city officials coming from other departments that they, 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 they now they were in charge of international relations offices. And, and they were lacking from basic diplomatic skills to knowing uh, some, how to navigate uh, the, the geopolitical scene and the who's who, and also how city networks work and how to engage with them, what's, what's, what should be the priorities, because at the, end, at the end of the day, the resources in terms of human resources and, and, and actual funds are limited to cities. So I mean, you, you cannot be in any network, in any event. So, so uh, capacity building is an important thing, uh, and it came out in all the in interviews we did. And since then, we, we partnered with UN Habitat, the, the UN agency in charge of, of uh, urban issues, to, to train uh, government officials from cities uh, and also provinces in sometimes. And in the last two years, we've over 100 uh, government officials uh, from cities and regions in international relations, giving them skills and ways to, to evaluate their work. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that. Um, so as I mentioned, partnerships are equally important. So for us at MTA Visions, we're lucky because we are split between corporate social responsibility and government affairs. So when it's time for partnership, especially as it pertains to funding, we just tap into our CSR department and we talk. We call someone from philanthropic affairs of some sort and we're typically able to fund that particular program. Um, for you, Mr. Holt, um, I know you guys have a lot of great examples of successful partnerships between Quebec and U.S. cities and states. Can you maybe talk about what those partnerships actually look like and maybe yeah. provide some insights on that some of our stakeholders here today. Well, we also get inspired by great partners like Alexis and the work that he's doing with, uh, with, with the scientific collaborations. So in fact, like the funny thing, we're gonna have our, like we're building up new partnerships. We're gonna have at the city uh, initiative in Denver, we're gonna have our chief scientists going with INSA America, like mm -hmm. uh, heading, heading there as well. So it's kind of funny to say that, yes, there's like successes, but there's like interesting projects like, like coming up. But, uh, and for me, like, especially because I'm, I was covering like, Canada, U.S., Quebec, U.S. relationships like for, for like more than a, a decade now. It's, it's kind of fascinating for me how local or international engagement is. Uh, the city initiatives with the mayors, like when you think about like all the treaties that Canada and the U.S. have, like when at the end, like when you want to talk about coastal resilience, the Great Lakes regions, is the mayors with the city initiative knows best and they know exactly what the urban planning is and how like sort of engaging the mayors on both sides of the borders is like key in this area. 
Same thing when it take, came to like for like the work of the regions, like the Great Lakes region is the third largest economy in the world. So when you have like the eight states and the two provinces, like it's, it's for me, it's mesmerizing how like what is the powerful economic engine it is when the governors getting together. So we are a prime member of the governors and premiers of the Great Lakes of the St. Lawrence, also working on like maritime traffic, like all the way to Europe and with the colleagues like from, from, from uh, the port of Antwerp in Europe, like how we can like develop these like corridors of trade mm -hmm. between, and, and unleash the potential of the trade relationship. But yes, we are sitting, like the Canada is as of national level is sitting on three trade deals between like Asia with CETA and also with, with USMCA. But when you think about it, like if you want to unleash the potential of it, like who's holding like the keys like of, of, of the trade routes? Like often like cities like just like ports and, and like and, and, and commercial routes like all like designed by by like local plannings as well. So it's fascinating for me also the work that has been done. And the thing that I would like to highlight, you were mentioning like the agreements that we have. Sometimes we look at the some national level, it's just like okay, like yes, like a state, like a city makes like a sister city agreement with another one and then it, like on the leadership of the mayors, what's going on. But I think we have made like more meaningful agreements than that, like in, in, in the past. And it's not just like recognizing like the driving license from like the states of Illinois with, with, with the province of Quebec. Um, we have like, a, a, we, we, we were in fact like in, the, uh, we, we have an agreement with USGS on mapping critical minerals, like on energy, natural resources, like Quebec holds the key of that jurisdiction. So if the U.S. wants to like push the envelope and like and make sure that they have access to critical minerals in Canada, well, they have to engage and have agreements with with the provinces. Same thing with energy. Uh, we are building right now a power hydro line between Quebec and 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 uh, the state of New York to New York City. Like this is like the most interesting and chat and like and, and thrilling like partnership that we have in energy right now. In fact, it's the only binational energy project that is really working between Canada and the US when you think about the cancellation of Keystone XL and everything. So there's a clean energy renewable project that is working because the state of New York and the province of Quebec work together like in to enhance like the agenda of the Biden Harris administration and the Trudeau World Maps in terms of energy. This project is key. So my point is, I mean, we have a lineup of like great successes to build on. When we have proved at the subnational level that we are credible, we are liable, and we can deliver projects. So if you want to foster a national agenda, you can have like agreements, trade agreements, but we have to come to a point of implementation. Bringing the states and the provinces and the cities at the early stage as you can in the discussion can really help move the needle and push the envelope of the agenda and making sure that you are delivering what the national agenda is looking for. And, and sometimes in the past, it was like, well, we're looking at cities, like, just, oh, we cannot control them, really. Like, oh, we name an ambassador, like, to help us. How much is going to help us? What well, the State Department wants to control us? How much, like, the national like, government is looking at it? I think we have, like, just, like, fully embraced the potential. And one of the great key stories that we had, I think, uh, was during the CETA round of negotiation. Canada allowed Quebec to have its own negotiator at the table to make sure that yes, federal is ne responsible to ne negotiate the agreement, but we're gonna will come a time of implementation, and they bring the negotiator from each provinces, making sure that legislation at the subnational level will be ready to implement the trade agreement, which is like for me like one of the key advancement that has been done in terms of subnational diplomacy, like in this area that we you really take for granted. Like, well, the federal government is doing it. No, like you want to make sure that you make it cohesive and people like are like on board. Well, bring all like, the people in the, of the totem <laughs> all the way to the citizen at the table. This is a great sign for me of international leadership when you can like unleash that kind of potential at the subnational level. And we have a history of great successes to build on. Yeah, you gave some incredible examples about different partnerships. But I believe given like Quebec's, you know, vast influence and really strong international affairs strategy, that you can also use language as a yeah. tool to foster diplomatic collaborations. Um, one of the things that I, I, I adapted from one of our MTA Vision's cultural diplomacy program yeah. is called Gad Lingo. So when I served as a, um, a chair of a global adaptive diplomacy working group with WCAPS, which is a strong partner with LC Wins, 
we decided to provide national security, similar to what you were talking about, um, professional development training ahead of time. Yep. And so we partnered with the embassies and we had the ambassadors talk about the cultural aspects of the countries. And then we partnered with the university um, in the U.S. that had a top language program that aligned with that embassy to then actually teach elementary introduction to that particular language. So we did it, yeah. covered French, Spanish, um, Spanish, Haitian Creole with the Haiti Embassy and, and so many others. So given your national affairs strategy is so vast, I'm just curious, um, have you guys leveraged you know, any specific focus on the Francophone countries and maybe using the French language as an advantage to cultivate partnerships abroad? Yeah. And while you're sharing your perspective, maybe um, think about you know, some strategies that the U.S. can take, given that we are increasing our outreach to Latin American countries and maybe perhaps this might be something that local governments can consider maybe hiring someone, a Spanish speaker, to help them also leverage um, their relationship and strategies with Latin America. Well, uh, it's, I mean, it might sound simplest, but we do diplomacy with who we are. And that's maybe, and I mean, I see my friend from Catalonia here, it's just like, we have like a strong history, and look at Alexi as well. We have a strong history of cultural, educational diplomacy, because seeing who we are is so important for us locally, and also like make sure that our voice is, is heard, like, Globally, so it's like there's a, this kind of need of survival, like in, in who we are, and I think like for anybody, it's like you can be friends with the United States, you cannot like get out of like this principle. And as I was mentioning, it's not just a funny accent; it's like I'm the remaining part of like this, like surviving part of like France in in, in North America, uh, and I'm I'm proud of it. And and I think like we we and and there's values attached to that, and I think there's a responsibility for Quebec to just make sure that it raises voice on it. That's why we are full member of the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. At the same level of France and Quebec, uh, and Canada, like we vote like fully rights like member. We have like, we are also a member at UNESCO in terms of cultural and scientific like representation. We have our own seat at UNESCO as well. So uh, we managed to have an agreement between the federal government and the province of Quebec, because like why Quebec will have a seat in the UN organization. So we managed that in, two, in 2003, very proud of, of, of that as well. And uh, we, it came with the feeling that we have the responsibility of leadership to promote French, not only like in the US, we work closely with Louisiana in the United States with the network of French Alliance and the work that France is doing. We opened recently our three first af offices in West Africa. So we have an office in Dakar, Senegal, and also in Morocco, uh, making sure that we are creating this kind of like, because it's, there is like an English strong environment, like in, but there's like a need for discovering the French culture, content and also like to do trade in French. And I think we can be part of solutions like in, in Latin America and also for U.S. issues like abroad, like in Haiti, when the U.S. is asking for uh, Canada support, well, there's a good chance that the policemen will be policemen from Quebec if you send policemen in, in, in Haiti. Or same thing in the reconstruction work that uh, Haiti has, has to do. So, I mean, understanding and who has the responsibility of like civil se uh, security at home? Well, it's the province of Quebec. And we have our own programs of solidarity on top of that. When we help, like, and Haiti is like a key partner that, that, that we have. So understanding, and another, like, when I say like we do, like, diplomacy with who we are, I think the interesting thing is like standing up also in this Francophone environment for the value of democracy, but also human rights. And we took a very interesting tack, I think, in LGBTQ plus rights and help like and on the hands like the LGBT and we work closely with this department we are exploring partnership with the state department how we can be with a uh, social voice turn how we can like develop this kind of like and so how Quebec can be sustained like US or help the United States in the force that is to outreach these communities who have like very challenging like uh, uh, issues in, in the francophone world so understanding where people are part of the solution at the some national level where Quebec, the Catalan, the Welsh, the Flanders, the Scots can be part of that in the State Department engaging with us, I think, abroad. Is it not just looking for what we have in this kind of two-way street between bilateral, but how we can be part of the solution more globally is like something that we definitely have to explore and dig like a little bit more, like not only for South America. And I'm already mentioning to the mayor, we just opened our first offices in Bogota. 
Uh, we have an office in Sao Paulo. We have an office. Canada never stopped having a relationship with Havana. So we have an office in Cuba. Uh, we have our biggest, our flagship is in Mexico. So really trying like also to develop this relationship. We're looking at Canada, US, and Latin America and South America, looking at how we can like connect our governors or premiers and the local governors together. I think that will be like, there's a lot of political solutions to many issues that we're facing. Thank you. So thus far we've explored the international portfolios of Quebec largely. Uh, we learned about innovative practices and trainings for Barcelona. We provided um, insights into programs and partnerships and creative ways and avenues that you can take in order to engage. And so I wanted to uh, pass it over to Ambassador Hachigan. So at MTA Visions, we typically give our clients you know, contacts or we encourage them to participate in coalitions and organizations like C40 or USCLG. So I wonder if you can share with us uh, if there's any central resources that your office at the State Department provides if stakeholders that are looking to engage in international affairs. Well, we're working on it, um, but we do have some opportunities. I mentioned Cities Forward in my earlier address, so that's a new program that's going to pair American and Latin American cities. We have another one, um, U.S. ASEAN Smart Cities Project, um, which uh, you know is is funding the collaboration of American cities with those in uh, Southeast Asia. There's a new one that was announced at uh, this last COP called Scale. Um, which is a subnational climate program that is getting stood up. Um, so that's what we have so far. I I was one of the co-chairs of the, of the Truman study before I took this job, and they recommended the study recommended uh, the creation of like a competitive fund, uh, which I think is a great idea. But we have not even figured out the money for that yet. Um, uh, but that's I think something. I would like to have exist. Um, it's probably actually best not living in the State Department, probably best living in a foundation or a nonprofit, but, um, but I think it's a really good idea. Um, there are some international banks that do, you know, that, that work with cities, uh, foundations uh, would be another place to look. Thank you. So we promised with this panel that we will talk about some of the barriers that cities often face and that you would get some really creative uh, perspectives on how to overcome some of those barriers, such as funding, local apprehensions, and even the sister city partnerships are under criticism. And so I wanted to turn to you, Mr. Holt, if you can you know, maybe give us some strategies on how to approach local apprehension. Usually at MTA Visions, we establish some sort of citizen engagement where we help the citizens understand what they're working on locally and how that impacts them globally and vice versa. And so I don't know if maybe you can talk to us about maybe a public relations standpoint that our stakeholders can take when they're making the international affairs case to their respective residents. That's a good question. I mean, that's the thing, it's like, especially at the city and municipal level, people are expecting, it's, like it's, it's easy to have like justify, I mean, my colleague ambassador would probably disagree with me, just like what to justify like the national engagement of like the money that you can put abroad but so when you come like to the city level and when you come to the the, the state of the provincial level this is quite challenging um i think and we face like the the, the, the questions like why quebec is doing that there's also it's, we always have to i would not say convince the people at home because like it's people are very proud of like the, the brand that quebec has developed like over time and and, and people are looking up like to to to, to push like the the, the, the aspiration that we have. I, I think the, um, we have to make sure that it's linked always to, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, an obligation of results and making sure that we make these connections, that people can see that we big like a bigger tent when uh, we can have like the cities like just like involved, when we have the universities connected together we can talk on the behalf, when we have the chambers of commerce connected to each other, when we have like, the more that we are, the better we are doing our job as being the connectors, and, we, and the better, I mean, that's the formula, the, 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 public, the public statement that has to be done, because after that, the, the universities are the amb our ambassadors, of like, or like holding the flag of our, uh, some national engagement. 
the companies, like the, the circus that we are helping, the artists that we are helping, like they are the one holding the forts and doing like the real public relations that, that we need in terms of like enlisting and justifying the work, the, the, the good work and the, the important work that we have to do. But it's, uh, if we try to, it, it, we cannot preach, uh, there's no choir to preach to, <laughs> I, I, I will say. And, and the better thing is, is like to, to lead with results, with like a very focused oriented, uh, laser focus orientation on delivering results for our citizens. So the sister cities um, partnerships, um, the MOUs that they enter into are coming under criticism. Um, researchers say that these MOUs just stop there and then nothing materializes thereafter. I know that Barcelona just entered a couple years ago into a sister city agreement with Shenzhen, which I had an opportunity to participate in the State Department's first economic diplomacy mission to Shenzhen, where we brought over our top 25 entrepreneurs that connected with their top 25 mm -hmm. businesses. So we understand the importance of engaging with the city. And that was done through the lens of a sister city partnership. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe talk about um, what Barcelona is doing to move beyond just MOU and materializing that partnership to essentially show what economic cooperation could look like in practice? Sure. We have, we have really good relationships actually with Shenzhen. I mean, I know that in a previous plan, panel we were talking about climate cooperation with, with Chinese cities. Uh, I spent over 10 years living in Shanghai and, 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 and that helped a lot in, in establishing some relationships with, with, with between Barcelona and Chinese city. Uh, I understand the criticism about MOUs just for the sake of MOUs, just for the sake of the picture or the press release. If, if that, I mean, MOU should be the instrument to create the foundations for, for a long lasting cooperation, but that usually means funding. If you just sign a, a, an agreement that doesn't commit any funding, uh, it, it's, 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 it's not, not, probably not gonna, gonna, gonna succeed. I would say that there are many other ways. Um, we're running out of time. Out of time. So, please now we're just going to say that beyond sister cities partnerships and, and, and MOUs, there are other ways of, of city to city cooperation through the networks we mentioned, through the trans, transporter agglomerations like the ones you were mentioning that the U.S. might have with Canada or with Mexico or in Europe we have with the Euro regions, and 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 also in city diplomacy. I mean, not every city is DC in terms of how many embassies and the World Bank and international organizations, but many cities that host uh, foreign consulates can do a lot by engaging with the consular core based in the city. That's a the great instrument that not every city is actually making the most of. So these together with other niche diplomacies like science diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, gastronomic diplomacy could be like really cool tools for cities to engage internationally. Yeah, and I want to close out with this one quote. Um, so when America sneezes, the world catches the cold. Cities are the safeguards of democracy, bedrock of diplomacy, and the global cough drop for a sustainable world order. And that's my quote. You guys are free. Feel free to use that. That's an excellent, excellent way way to end. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcome in, in uh, thanking our panel, Maritza, Ambassador Hashigian, Alexis, John Francois. Thank you so much.